Hey everyone, it's Stacey Barr here. I am with Dermot Crowley today. Um, we're going to dive into a demonstration together on how to make workplace urgency measurable. Um, but before we do, I'm going to introduce you to Dermot. Hi everyone, Dermot here. <laughs> Dermot is um, the founder of Adapt Productivity and is one of Australia's most recognised thought leaders on personal productivity. He has a combined passion for productivity and technology and that had led him to start Adapt in 2002 um, with a, a clear focus on helping busy executives manage their time and their priorities and their email in uh, today's modern workplace. Now Dermot's become one of Australia's leading thought leaders on productivity. Um, his, his training and coaching programs change behaviours and help participants to apply the principles to their existing technology like uh, Microsoft Outlook, I'm a user of Outlook so this resonates with me, uh, to smartphones and also to tablets. Uh, Dermot is also a best-selling author of two books published by Wiley. The first one is Smart Work and the second one is Smart Teams. Now, full disclosure, uh, Dermot is, is a friend of mine and I've gotten to know him through Thought Leaders Business School, which we've both been a part of for quite a few years now. Dermot, I've kind of lost track. Five, um, at least five years. Five, yeah, there you go. Um, so thanks so much for agreeing to do this uh, exercise uh, with me. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that um, shortly, but is there anything else that you'd like to add about what's happening more recently in your work? Yeah, look, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Stacey. This is so exciting to do this and it's very relevant to a piece of work that I'm working on at the moment. So, look, I guess um, just to, to kind of map my journey, uh, I, I wrote Smart Work uh, about three and a half, four years ago, which was very much based on personal productivity. And, and that's something that I've been I've been focused on for a long time. And um, Smart Teams was published uh, two years ago, which was much more about how we create more productive cultures and out of that came uh, the, the book I'm writing at the moment which uh, at the moment is titled The Urgency Trap and um, that may change mm. but it's going to be all about workplace urgency and I, I think it's one of the the biggest issues that I see in organizations these days um, that are being driven by email, that are being driven by uh, heavy meeting cultures the, the challenge is people are really struggling with a lot of deadlines and uh, an urgent culture that is really killing their productivity. So this is where my head is at right now and very excited to try and measure it. Well, this is cool. That's certainly part of the reason why um, you and I talking about this today has come to be. Um, I think you contacted me, Dermot, when you read um, one of my Measure Up newsletter articles, I think it was the one called, Is Culture Really Too Intangible to Measure? That's um, right. And yeah, yeah, and then you you asked me um, if workplace urgency was measurable and I suggested that we we try out a couple of pumps techniques to find out and that that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to start with pumps step two. It's a technique called measurability tests um, and we're going to use that to make that little phrase, workplace urgency, more specific and measurable and if we succeed in doing that, which I hope we do, we're going to go on to pumps step three and that technique is called measure design and we'll go ahead and design one or two maybe quantitative measures for it. Um, now Dermot, you haven't learned pump before, right? No, no. Um, I'm, I've, I've read high level uh, overviews of the methodology but it's not, a, uh, it, it's not something that I deeply understand and it's not an area that I have any expertise in. Absolutely, that's fine. And therefore you don't really know how the measurability tests or measure design techniques work in detail and the only preparation I've really asked you to do is to ponder the question, when you work, walk into a workplace what do you notice that, that makes you think urgency is a problem? Um, which is really all the preparation you need to, to dive into this. Um, yeah. Before we do, Dermot, I'm, I'm really curious about why you're interested in measuring workplace urgency. Um, maybe give us a bit of context about um, why workplace urgency might matter in the work that you're doing with clients. 
Mm, absolutely. So um, this has been a what I would call a soapbox subject for me for many years. So when I run training, whether it be personal productivity or, or team productivity training, I generally have a bit of a rant about the uh, amount of urgency that seems to drive so many of my, my client companies. So I generally work in the corporate market, and that could be anything from a bank to a law firm to a hospital to a marketing uh, company. Uh, it doesn't matter where I go, I tend to find that urgency tends to um, drive a lot of our activity. And I guess what happened for me earlier this year, I, I actually attended a, um, a leadership program at Harvard University. And uh, the thinking that came out of that for me really helped me to understand how I could position urgency as a, as a um, not just a problem in organizations, but I could actually help um, senior people especially to use urgency as a force for good, not evil. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the problem that I've always had is if I go into a leadership team and I, I tell them that they need to dial down the urgency in their organization, the challenge I have is they come back at me and they'd say, well, hold on, we actually need urgency uh, because that's how we get traction, that's how we get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to just say urgency is bad. And uh, coming out of Harvard, what I realized was um, what, what people need is a way of moderating urgency because sometimes it's good and, and we need to get that traction. So we need to be able to dial it up sometimes, but we also need to be able to dial it down. Does that, could I just check in before I go through the model that you put up on screen, can I just check in, does that make sense to you? It does make sense and you know what, there's already clues in what you've said Dermot about how we can make this, this just this phrase workplace urgency more measurable, especially that idea that urgency isn't always bad. So part yeah. of I think what we'll get to is what kind of urgency is bad and that yeah, might be right. where we focus. Yeah, yeah, so that that's really great because um, I, I think there's probably um, a number of different types of urgency. There's, there's real urgency and there's false urgency. And there's reasonable urgency and there's unreasonable urgency. And, and that's something that I'm playing around with and, and helping people to become more discerning about mm -hmm. what they're dealing with, I think is, is one of the, the steps that is needed. Yeah. Um, another, another step is, is very much built into the, the model that you're looking at on screen. So. I've really thought about writing the book uh, mainly with managers in mind because I believe they are the people that can impact urgency the most because they can operate above and below themselves. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone has a role to play in moderating urgency uh, or, or if we decide um, moderating negative urgency in an organization. Um, I reckon that the, the key thing that workers need to focus on is how they themselves can work more proactively. And I believe there's a lot of very practical things you can do to organize yourself that will help you to dial down the unnecessary urgency and, and to work more proactively. Lovely. I, I think at the leadership level, their, their key focus is to build a culture, a more proactive culture. Um, so that our urgency doesn't have the same grip that it might have at the moment. But when it comes to managers in the middle, I reckon their their key focus is actually moderating the urgency, and and that will what the the strategies that they apply will depend on whether the urgency is externally driven or it's internally driven. So they might need to actually create urgency for a project themselves, so that'll be internally driven urgency. And they, the, the key strategy there is they need to mobilize people. But sometimes they've got externally driven urgency coming at the team uh, that is, is not really uh, a good use of people's time. It's, it's, it, it's a, um, an unreasonable or a false type of urgency. And I reckon that managers need to learn to absorb that and protect their team from the, the negative impact of that urgency. Um, I also reckon that they need to be able to recognize when there is urgency happening within their teams that doesn't really need to happen. If people are just, you know, very busy and the wheels are spinning, but they're not actually going anywhere, they need to recognize that and diffuse that urgency. And then 
uh, when things are truly urgent and it is real and they need to be able to deal with that, I reckon rather than just reacting to it, they need to learn to respond in a, a reasonable way. And for me, there's a huge difference between responding and reacting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess this this model kind of sums up the, the whole book and, and the different areas that I'm going to talk about when it comes to the different types of urgency. What it um, it sounds like, just just with that short explanation from you, Dermot, what it sounds like to me is in those three blue boxes, the you know leaders are responsible to build culture, managers are responsible to moderate urgency, workers are responsible to work proactively. Those are the three drivers, the things that are the most important to happen that will create an effect, that will cause the effect of um, a workplace that has an appropriate kind of urgency going on in an appropriate amount. Does that, have I understood that correctly? Yeah, I think so. And, and I guess the other filter to lay over this is, I believe leaders are a subset of managers and also a subset of workers. So rather than just having a hierarchical view of this, um, if, a, if a leader, if let's say a, a CEO or, or a divisional leader in an organization was reading my book, what I'd want them to do is to definitely understand the strategies that they need to put in place to build a culture, but they also need to recognize that they also have a management role mm -hmm. and they have a worker role, so they also need to work proactively and they yeah. also need to moderate urgency at their level. So um, there's a few different layers in there as well, which... Um, yeah into this. That, well, and that sounds sensible. So I think what we're going to look at now is what is the measure of the outcome of that model working the way it should, mm. which is the this thing that we're currently labeling workplace urgency, but we'll need to dive into to figure out what that yeah. what the result, what the outcome really is of, of this model working mm. as it should. Right. You, you ready? Yep. <laughs> I'm all, all set. Right, cool. All set. All righty. So I did ask you to ponder what does that workplace urgency um, look like? And yeah. the reason I asked you to do that, Dermot, is because really we want to we want to be able to to get to make this this thing workplace urgency a lot more tangible, a lot more specific than it currently is. So the measurability tests in Pump are going to help us do that. Um, the measurability test will take us through five. We might get through all five, but the first three tests are the most important. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's each of these tests is going to help us find better words to say what you really mean by this thing called workplace urgency. Mm. So the first test is to turn it into a result. What's the result that you want to have that has to do with workplace urgency? Have you? Do you want to just like just go top of mind or, or what, whatever? Um, um, so I would it would be helpful if I talk about what I notice when I go into an organization and, and um, see what yeah, drops yeah, out. Start there. So, you know, I guess um, when I walk into an organization, often it's in a training um, situation where I, I've got a group of people in front of me, but sometimes it's actually onto the floor in an organization. And when there is a, a very urgent culture, the the first thing I notice is uh, people's obsession with email and the amount of distraction that email can cause these people. So often you get people who can't even stop and listen to you because they are doing emails while you're talking and they're constantly reacting to those emails. Um, a second thing that I notice is um, the volume of meetings and a lot of managers and senior managers who are just going from one meeting to another often late and it feels very reactive. Okay, when you said volume, did you say volume, Dermot? Yeah, the volume of meetings, yeah. Volume, okay, great. So, you know, that could mean that they're spending 80% of the day in meetings just going from one back-to-back -back meeting to another. Oh, okay, so the, the actual quantity of, of time in meetings, volume of time. Yeah, yeah, that'd be right. I th you know what I thought? I was getting really sensory specific and I was thinking it was how loud they were. Oh, right, okay, yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's important to get the words right. It is. Um, 
A, a third thing that I notice is people tend to have a, um, well, they're more likely to work in one of two reactive zones. So what I call the first minute or the last minute. So they're, they've either got a work style where they're just constantly reacting to things the minute they come up. So when an email comes into their inbox, they respond to it immediately. Or they procrastinate about things and they leave those things, again, for the sake of argument, let's say it's an email, they leave it in the inbox until it becomes urgent and then they deal with it. So that's what I call leaving it until the last minute. So um, rather than working somewhere in the middle of those two zones, which is what I call the proactive zone, they tend to always put themselves in a situation where they're reacting and, and often unnecessarily. Okay, okay. That's super useful. Anything else? Yeah, I, I think there's uh, often a confusion between um, the meaning of urgent and important. So people would say to me, oh, that's really important. It's due tomorrow. And I kind of go, eh, just because it's due tomorrow doesn't mean it's important. They're different <laughs> things, but people often prioritize by urgency and they don't realize that it's a more nuanced thing than that. Okay, cool. I'm I'm just looking over these these words that you said that I've been kind of typing down, and it seem it seems like um, distraction and um, reactivity and procrastination are kind of the important themes. I think in my mind, urgent versus important sort of re relates to the reactive a little bit. Like it's super important, so I have to react right right now but no no it's yeah. not actually important it's just somebody else has told you that you need to react to serve yeah. them so distraction right. reaction and procrastination yeah absolutely and and i guess ultimately what what again if i was going to a workplace and i saw all this happening what i would ultimately see is a lot of stress and uh, i would probably hear stories of a lot of burnout Mm. So well, I guess okay. one of my theories is the idea that um, working reactively is sometimes necessary and sometimes a good thing. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I would call acute uh, when we're, we're forced into a reactive zone and that is uh, acute, it's like a spike. And that's not in itself a problem, but when urgency and reactivity becomes acute and chronic, that's when the burnout happens. That's when the anxiety levels go up and teams quite often implode. Chronic, that's good. All right. Actually, I might leave that up here. Now, our, our, our job right now, Dermot, is to with that that more rich kind of description of what workplace urgency is about or the bad kind of workplace urgency is to turn this into a statement um, that that either and you can do this in one of two ways you can either describe the state of really bad workplace urgency that you want to reduce or you can state it as what a workplace is like when there isn't unnecessary or the bad kind of, of urgency mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which way you want to go in the positive or in the negative yeah. um, but Let's have a go at, at writing down a statement that describes um, this workplace urgent, urgency a, a, as, a, as a result or as a, as a, as a goal that um, brings in some of that richness of what you've just described. Sure. Could I, could I add one more thing to our list that, is, uh, that has occurred to me and I think it's, it's really important here? Um, there's a there's an overall theme for me about um, people having control and having agency. So mm -hmm. I guess a lot of people that I talk to about urgency feel that they have no control over it because they're working in an urgent culture and that's just the way it is around here. And yeah. that I don't agree with that. I think there's lots of things they can do to get control over it. Okay, absolutely. That's no, good, good, good. Right. Okay, um, if you want to take a moment to, to just ponder this and see what, what kind of statement comes out that describes what you really mean by workplace urgency, given that lovely description, 
just take yeah. a moment. But when you've got your first set of words, just say them out loud, Dermot, I'll write them down. And sometimes just seeing them written down helps you then go back and tweak and change. So don't, don't aim for perfection before you start. Sure. There's a nice little birdie in the So room. I might have a go at um, the, the, the negative, if you like, um, rather yeah, than the positive. Um, so an urgency-driven workplace Yep, don't wait for me to type, just go. Yeah. Um, results in lots of busy work, lots of low quality busy work that causes stress and burnout. Nice. That's a great first attempt. <laughs> it could even be. So this stuff here is the key. Yeah. Lots of low quality, busy work that causes stress and burnout. So if, if I say to you, what does workplace urgency mean? You'd say lots of low quality, busy work that causes stress and burnout. Yeah, or, or so lots of activity, but not a lot of outcomes. So I, I think what's missing from that is um, lots of, of um, low quality, busy work um, that does not achieve outcomes, but causes stress and burnout. That does not achieve or, outcomes, but causes stress and burnout. Yeah. How's that looking? Yeah. I think it could be tighter. Um, and in time, sure. it probably will be. We'd, I think, uh, I don't think I've mentioned this to you before, Dermot, you might like it. I, I live by the 80% rule, especially yeah. with pump, is that once it's 80% there, move on. Because Good when enough. you move on, then you realise what you can do with the rest of the 20% yeah, yeah. if it's worth yeah. it. That's that's great. If there was I think one that's change I could I, I would I, I suppose make would be remove low quality because I'm not sure it's fair to to state that, but I think it is fair to say that there's lots of busy work um, that does not I think it does not achieve outcomes is suggesting that it's low quality anyway. So okay, you know what I'm actually going to just um, can I strike that out. I just don't want to lose yeah, a, sure. sometimes That's it's really useful to um, have a record of these things. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is just paste it here without the low quality. Yeah. And that is our current result statement. Lots of busy yeah. work that does not achieve outcomes but causes stress and burnout. Yeah. And this is what we're trying to get a measure of ultimately. Yeah. How much is this happening in any given workplace? Yeah. Is there a, is there a okay. point where we need to bring in the idea of um, unnecessary uh, urgency versus um, necessary urgency or, or real versus false, that, that dynamic? Uh, I don't, at this point, I don't think so. I think as we go through this process, it'll become clearer to you probably before yeah. it becomes clearer to me whether that's relevant. But I think given that you've decided to frame this in the negative, then we, we really are looking at how are we describing the, the, um, the unnecessary urgency, the bad urgency. Yeah. yeah. Not the, um, not the, well, the false urgency, not the, not the, okay stuff yeah and yeah. it could be that you want to develop a measure of good urgency and you just follow a similar process to do it but yeah to get to get to get a foundation for this built i think we we can safely stick with with what you've got there so far and good. work with that yeah 
Okay, so congratulations, we've passed test A, we now have uh, a result. <laughs> Very nice. About what workplace agency is. Now, the next thing we want to do is look uh, inside that result and just see if there are any words that aren't observable or like I call them weasel words. A weasel word is something that if, if three different people looked at the word, they could draw at least three different interpretations of what it, yeah. different interpretations of what it means. Um, now, we may or may not do anything with this, but I'm going to just for, for, um, I was I was going to swear, but for for um, for fun, um, yeah. you know you know that phrase, Dermot, for blank and giggles. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. This PG rated. Yeah, um, I'm going to pick out a few just so that we can talk a little bit about them and see if if talking about them helps us get any extra clarity on on them or find better phrases. So I think busy work might be something worth just giving a meaning to, yeah. and um, possibly also. Outcomes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, stress, stress and burnout. We probably shouldn't treat them together, but we might treat them together, um, yeah. and we'll, we'll just see. I mean, for most people, they do know what stress and burnout is, but um, yeah. you know, checking is, is not a bad idea. So yeah. let's start with busy work, Dermot. Can you just put in language that a 10-year-old might understand what busy work means? Activity that does not have high value or impact. Okay. High value for who or impact for who? Uh, I guess for the team or the organisation. Okay. Okay, good. And when you say high value or impact, does that does that have anything to do with it being meaningful in the context of the organisation's strategy or the context of the team's current goals or the team's um, purpose or the organization's purpose or any of those sorts of things? I guess we could look at it at all of those levels, but I suppose if I'm looking at this mainly with a manager as the central focus as my avatar, then it would probably be um, at the, the individual or team level. Yeah. And um, it's it's about how connected what they're doing is to the organization's strategy ultimately. I'm going to have a play with this. I'm not writing down your words exactly, but no. I yeah, yeah, I'm very comfortable with it. that. Yeah. Yeah, contribution to the, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And so, and I also want to change this activity um, that doesn't. Um, uh, directly contribute? Aid or um, directly is a great word that doesn't directly, it's kind of like it doesn't directly contribute to the team's contribution yeah. to organisational strategy. Um, add? Add value. Um, or serve. So, yeah, I, I, it's like okay. add value is another weaselly phrase, but if, if we're comfortable that we understand what it really means in that sentence, I'm happy to leave it. Were you going to suggest something else, Dermot? Uh, I, um, I think I just said um, serve, directly serve the team's contribution, but I'm very comfortable with that value. Okay, that's no worries. Uh, also, well, I'll put serve in. That's, that's cool. All right, cool. Yeah. So we've just made busy work clearer. Tell me more yeah. about outcomes. I guess that the, the outcomes um, uh, would be the team's contribution to organisational strategy. Okay. Uh, and just... maybe it's fairer to say in the original statement um, required outcomes because everything has an outcome, but are they aligned with what the organisation requires? Yeah. Yep, great, great distinction. Okay, 
And if that's what a required outcome is, then one of the ways that we can tweak your current, um, whoops, your current statement up here is it's got redundancy in it now because if we do the translating, what what that would translate into is lots of activity that doesn't directly serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy that does not achieve the team's contribution to organisational strategy. It's kind of going to be in there twice. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, based on how you've defined busy work. We could cross out all of that and just say lots of busy work that causes stress and burnout based on how you define busy work and we, we, we can replace busy work or at least in brackets after it put the, the meaning that you just created yeah, here. Yeah. I'll show you what I mean because yeah. it might be a bit, yeah, yeah. A bit weird to follow without the visual oh good grief I don't know why it's highlighting like that I'm just not in control of my mouse today <laughs> so we can get rid of does, does not achieve required outcomes, we can replace it with busy work would replace, like, like I admit busy word's got a nice buzz to it, so you may kind of want to keep it in there, but just in brackets put in mm -hmm. the definition. Um, so it would basically say activity doesn't directly serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy but causes stress and burnout, that's kind of what we're saying. So there's, uh, it's, it's really shaping up nicely. There's an element that I'm realizing now that is missing for me because this is yeah. about urgency. Um, you could do busy work in a very proactive way. So busy work is really, it's really talking about the quality of what you're working on. And this is another dynamic. This is, this is about when you're working on it. So are you working on that stuff proactively or are you doing it at the last minute or, or um, at the first minute? So I think we also need to have something in the statement that talks to the, the urgency and maybe just putting in the word urgent. So lots of urgent busy work. Does that make sense? Or lots of urgent activities. It does. Um... I, I think we can, Dermot, I think we can put the word urgent in there. I just love the way you define urgent as first minute or last minute. That makes it tangible. Like for a 10 year old, if you say urgent or you say something that you're doing in the first minute right away or you're doing at yeah. the very last minute, I think the 10 year old gets the second bit a little yeah, bit more like tangible. That. Yeah. yeah. So that could be um, lots of first minute or last minute activity yeah. that doesn't directly serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy but causes stress and burnout. Yeah. I know it's nice. long mm. but it says it says what you mean and look this, this happens a lot Dermot when people are first trying to figure out how to make a, a really broad intangible goal um, measurable, they often find they need a lot more words than they expected first go, but yeah. later on you, you can find ways to, to streamline it. Yeah, How are you yeah. feeling so yeah. far? Yeah, no, no, it's really, it, it gives you a lot of clarity and I, I love I love the way you, um, you go into the meaning of the weasel words because it, that just provides such clarity about what am I really trying to say here and what, are, what, are the, what is the reader potentially understanding by reading that, it's very useful. Mm. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. It's that was a revelation, revelation to me when I learned about weasel words. It was yeah. by um, Don Watson. I don't know if you remember. He was um, ex prime minister of Australia. Paul Keating's um, speechwriter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote a book called uh, Death Sentence: The Decay of Public Language, where he he wow. really talked about the damage of weasel words. It was so inspiring to me. Right. Love it. So I reckon we won't bother. Um, defining the meaning of stress and burnout uh, now. It's something you might want to go back and do, Dermot, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we will be here for a very long time if we dive that deeply. Yeah, yeah, good. Now, get, 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 the, get the concept, yeah. Now, the third, so now we've got it passing test B, which is are there any weasel words? Well, we're pretty confident we've, we've got rid of at least the most important ones in this, in this statement we have now. So we're going to take it to test C. Could, could I just ask a question? Test C is really asking. 
Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, doing this exercise fully, would that be the only, if you nailed that statement, would that be the only statement or might you have several statements that would describe different aspects of the same problem that you see? Uh, sometimes you can end up with uh, needing to explain the concept in more than one statement. So if yeah. you're looking at that and you're going, there's something really important about workplace urgency that that statement we've currently got here doesn't even hint at yeah yeah then that means you you probably would end up with another one and that's where test c becomes really important right. because if you yeah. decide you want to add that in now and we'll do it just for for fun it causes stress and burnout and uh wastes resources on stuff that didn't need to be done yeah yeah so if, if it included something like that, then we'd take it into test C, which is, is it multi-focus? Is it talking about more than one yeah. thing? Yeah. And I'd say easily, um, yes, this is, because we're talking about lots of first minute or last minute, act minute activity. It doesn't serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy. Potentially we've got, and it causes stress and burnout, and it wastes resources on stuff yeah. that didn't need to be done because each of these things are probably worth measuring in their own right. Yes. Yeah. Great. So it would be lots of first minute, last minute activity that doesn't directly serve the organisation, that causes stress and burnout, that wastes resources on stuff that didn't need to be done. So that would be a thorough way of yeah. kind of expanding, you know, the, the, um, the, the last result statement that you, you, came, yeah, you, you had in the previous step. Yeah. Any, any questions, reactions to that? No, no, that makes sense. Um, and it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me to be able to describe the issue of urgency, um, possibly highlighting different issues in different situations so being mm -hmm. able to separate out into three is, is quite nice in that way and what you just said Dermot about in different situations some may be more important than others that's exactly what test d helps us do so mm. test d will have us look at each one of these individually and for each individual client or organization that that you have or that reads your book Dermot um they can do this for themselves and figure out of these um, three or maybe you'll end up with four or five mm -hmm. I don't know hopefully you won't end up with more than that because that's yeah. um that really does become a handful but for each yeah. of these each um each particular client gets to say well should should we try and reduce this and they'll go yeah because we want to make sure that everyone's contributing to organizational strategy yeah. can we do something about this can we reduce the first minute last minute activity that's not serving the organization and they'll go yeah. yeah pretty sure we can because you've got a model to help them Dermot yeah will they and they'll go yeah this is something that we're going to give resources to we're actually going to spend the time to invest in Dermot's model and get his help and have him come on board and, and stop stop first minute last minute activity that's not serving the organization's strategy mm. yeah so but, all the rationale needs is a yes or no there. It doesn't need a, a qualifying yeah. statement. Oh, it, it should, you should have a qualifying statement there, okay. but it's going to vary depending on the client. Yeah. Um, so here we could say yes, because um, we've hired Dermot. Yeah. Um, with uh, stress and burnout, like there may be an organization or a business that has lots of first minute, last minute activity that isn't serving the organization's strategy, but it isn't causing stress and burnout, at least not yet. They can nip it in the bud before it gets to that point. So they may say, no, not a problem yet. Yeah. And that way they get to pick and choose which of the workplace urgency results they're going to, to target, yeah. that they're going yeah. to measure, that they're going to improve. Yeah. And then if you if you say no to should, you don't really need to go on and do can or will because they're obviously going to be no as well. Is that right? Correct. That's right. Yep. And and generally, Dermot, what I say is if, if if any one of these results gets a no to any one of should, can and will, then it's not worth trying to measure at the moment. 
If you shouldn't yes. do it, obviously you shouldn't measure it. If you can't do anything about it, don't bother measuring it. And if you aren't yeah. prepared to commit the time and effort to changing it, don't measure it. Yeah, yeah, great. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. So test E is a, a way for, um, for people to think about, well, how does this connect to what's important strategically for us? So you can imagine that if, um, we'll just take this first one down. You can imagine that if an organisation is really struggling to achieve its strategic goals because of this urgency problem, then this first result, lots of first minute, last minute activity that doesn't directly serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy, you'd have to say, yes, that has a very strong link to what's important to the organisation, to the organisation strategy, because mm. they might have a corporate goal to reduce urgency or increase um, productivity or um, achieve more strategic targets. Yeah. It could be any any one of those things. They're just examples, really. So or, or the could idea they could, could they potentially have a. Uh, let's say a strategy that is happening next year where they need to rationalize the workforce so they know that the 80% of people that are going to be left are going to have to work more productively um, to be able to accommodate the, the amount of work given there's a smaller workforce. Does that make sense there? It do totally does. That's a brilliant example. Okay, lovely. So yeah, we've just put in examples here of why mm. improving this result and measuring this result might be important for any particular organisation. So it, it just helps helps give it context within the client's organisation. We've yeah. we've got it. We've you you've given it context in the whole idea of workplace urgency, but a client's also got to give it context into what's strategically important for them. And mm. yeah, your example here is fantastic. Yeah. So with this, um, this really needs to be done for every single different client because there's different issues that are important for them or could it be done more generically that would fit most uh, clients? I think you'd have a starting point that would be a generic starting point that would fit most clients. But yeah. I think each client would have to double check the should, can and will mm. on each of the results. Yeah. I think the results can be fairly generic that you would you would give to them and say the, these are the most important ones, but then they have to decide the should, can and will for them. Yeah. And they have to decide, well, how does that link to what's corporately important for us? And, and yeah. you know, for some, it might be your example where they're rationalising the workforce, but for others, it could be because um, they've just year after year not achieving their strategic targets because people are, are too urgent and they, they need to improve their ability to, to you know, execute and achieve their strategy. Yeah, yeah, great. Or something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can already think of different things that could potentially go there for each of them. You know, it's, it's very, very powerful. Super. So they would do test E for all three, or if you end up with more than three, all, all of the results that define workplace urgency. We've just mm. done it for one. Um, in the interest of time and just getting yeah. a good starting point. I think now we can say that we will choose that one yeah. and we'll take that one into measure design, unless there was one of the other two that you'd rather play with developing no, no, a that's, measure that's for, Dermot. I'll just scroll. You're okay with that? Yeah. All right. Well done. Thank you. No, well done, just, you. Well uh, done, let's, um. Well, <laughs> I'll, um, th this is why, like before we started recording, Dermot, I said to you that I, I often get anxious about this, especially when it's when someone's trying to measure something I've got no personal experience with. I get yeah. anxious thinking, is this going to work? Is this going to work? But I keep telling myself what I tell everybody else is just trust the process. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, and, and, and trust the client, trust you, Dermot, to know what you're really trying to achieve and, and trust the process just to, to give you a way to, to express that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now that we've got a measurable 
result, it makes sense to measure it. So we're moving across to the measure design technique in Pump, and I'm just going to paste that result in, which is the first step in designing a measure, is to put front and centre right there so yeah. you can focus on it, the result that you're wanting to develop a measure for. Yeah. Lots of first minute and last or last minute activity that doesn't directly serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy. So what we want to do here, Dermot, is to get a sense of what, what would be the evidence of how much first minute or last minute activity there is going on um, and evidence of whether that activity is serving the team's contribution to organisational strategy or not. So this, this can be a little bit tricky and it, it helps just to to ponder it for a little bit, but you're basically going to imagine that you're walking into a workplace where this is a problem, this particular result is a, um, is a problem, yeah. and you're going to figure out what would I go look for, what would I, I listen to, what would I, um, what would I, I, I touch, <laughs> you know, what, yeah. what, what yeah, would no, be the can... things that could convince me of how much this is happening. So when yeah. you're ready, just fire away and I'll type them down. Yeah, so high volumes of email noise. Uh, lots of interruptions. Um, large meetings that don't achieve outcomes. And when I say large, I mean, you know, a lot of people in, in, in the meetings and, and um, yeah. Um, people complaining about being busy a lot. Work being delegated at the last minute. People being unresponsive to emails in their inbox. People like they're not responding to emails. Yeah, so that they they're so overwhelmed by the the amount of emails that 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 more complex ones often just get buried in their inbox and then they wait until someone chases them up three times before they and then it becomes urgent before they deal with it. So that's kind of that last minute thing. Yep. Um, rework, um, high volumes of rework. Let's pause there, Dermot, because yeah. I've, I've got an idea that may or may not serve us here. Um, with what you've already got written there, I, I think if we can put it into two baskets, that may then, um, it may trigger yeah. a couple of more important ones, or it may be sufficient for us to get um, um, to get to get traction with it. The buckets yeah. I'd like to try and put this into is first minute bucket yeah, yeah. and last minute bucket. Right. So let me just set up those headings and then we will move them around. See if this works. Okay, tell me where to put what. Um, I think high volumes of email noise first minute, okay. interruptions first minute. Um, large meetings that don't achieve outcomes doesn't really fit into either. Okay. Um, People complain about being busy a lot. Um, doesn't really fit into either. It's kind of a blend. Yeah, um, it could be either, it could be both. Um, work being delegated the last minute is last minute. People being unresponsive is last minute.
uh, high volumes of rework is other. Okay. Does that help you? Like, are there any yeah, other that, really I mean, critically? You could add in a couple of things like that immediately helps me to focus on uh, additional ones, if that's helpful. So first minute, um, people, people reacting to emails. Yep. Um, last minute would be um, people um, using task lists that are um, deadline focused. And I know that sounds a bit weird because you yeah. think, oh, isn't that a good thing? But um, one of the yeah. principles that I firmly work with is most people manage their task list by due date. And that sucks them into a situation where they, they only then do things when they're close to the due date. Um, so the principle I work with is be very aware of your due date, but manage the start date. That's the proactive approach. Mm -hmm. I love it. And thankfully, Asana, which is the, the project and task manager app I use, now lets us do that. We can set start and finish dates for things. So I'm glad. Cool. Yeah, and that's so important. And so many apps out there that are around task management, they've gotten rid of start dates. They just have due dates. And, and unfortunately, um, it just creates this reactive way of working that so many people get sucked into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know what, Dermot, that's, I, I realise you could easily add more things to this. Yeah. Um, I think we've got enough to uh, to get to potential measures for this. Mm. And if you're comfortable, that's that's where yeah. I'd, I'd suggest we Perfect. head now. Perfect. Again, 80%. The next step, I'm just right, going to... That's 80% of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 80% rule, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just going to jump ahead to... So, show you what the next step's going to be and then come back to this list of, of sensory evidence. Sensory meaning um, it's just observable somehow. Yeah. The, honestly, the only way we can measure anything is if we can observe it in the real world. We can't really measure things in a parallel universe. We can't measure things in our heads. You know, The idea is that it's got to be in the physical world and our nature given five senses are the way we detect these things. Yeah. We're going to figure out potential measures by asking the question of the sensory evidence. How could we quantify this evidence? How could we count it up? How could we figure out how much there is and, and express it as a measure mm -hmm. that way? Um, there are two ways that we can go about this based on the, the list we've got here. One is to look at each individual one and go, how could we quantify that? How could we quantify high volumes of email noise? Could that be um, I'll just to, to kick you off with an example. Could that be the number of emails coming into people's inbox each day or each week? Yeah, very easily. All right, so let's put that down. Um, might be per person. So, you know, a team might have a lot of people. So it could be the average number or it could be actually total is probably not bad. Total number of emails coming into in inboxes, team, because we're focusing on teams here. So yeah. into team member inboxes, let's say each day, just for just yeah. for fun. And that would mean we'd go to the second one and would say, how could we quantify lots of interruptions? Do you have a thought about that, Dermot? Um. It, it could be something around um, uh, amount of uninterrupted focus time for each team member. Per week, maybe. Okay. And that we might measure that in something like hours or minutes. Yeah. Doesn't really matter, but okay. Good, good job. Uh, and let's go with the third one, people reacting to emails. Do you have an idea of how to quantify that? Um, I 
tell me more about what it means. What 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 is what does it mean if somebody like what would I be so doing if I reacted to an email? Typically, people will have email alerts turned on. So every time they receive an email, they get an audible or a visual alert, and they then mm -hmm. get to dealing with the email immediately when it comes in, rather than taking a more proactive approach to checking their email. I would recommend twice a day you would process emails thoroughly and and probably have a quick five minute check about once an hour, but um, then you turn off your email and you're focused on your work. So, oh, this is this is a bit clunky, <laughs> but yeah. the percentage of all the emails that are reacted to as soon as as they arrive, I've yeah. got my grammar wrong. Yeah. yeah, they arrive in the inbox. Yeah. Okay. So how's this sitting with you, the way that I'm phrasing the measures, uh, how those measures represent ways to quantify that, that evidence that you listed? Just what are your thoughts and feelings right now about this? Yeah, I'm comfortable with the statements and, and I know that um, while I think maybe some of them might not be all that feasible, I know that's probably going to come out in the next yeah. step where you, you look at the strength and the feasibility, so very comfortable. Which is fine, and that's you know this is why we and we start off usually with a fairly long list of potential measures because we know yeah. that um, some of them aren't going to be feasible. But we also know some of them aren't going to have a lot of strength either. They're not going to be really convincing evidence of the of, of the result that we're we're trying to measure. Yeah. Let's go on to last minute work being delegated at the last minute. How could we quantify that? Um, amount of lead time provided when work is delegated or requested. Total amount of lead time for work that is delegated or requested. Nice. Um, people being or, or unresponsive could be, could be to emails. Else. I guess this is. Sorry, say again. No, are you, you, were you going back to work being delegated at the last minute? Yeah, I, I was saying that an alternative could be it could be something around um, the number of instances where work is requested ASAP. Weasel word, I know. That's okay, but usually that's that's exactly the phrase people write in the yeah. in the email asking for it or whatever, so it's fine. I'll put it in quotes just in case there's a you know. Um okay. Yeah. Good. And and what you did then was perfect because for one particular piece of evidence there can be more than one way to quantify yeah. it. Yeah, and one might be more feasible than the other. I I, I get that, yeah. That's yeah, good. absolutely. Uh, let's go to people being unresponsive to emails in, in their inbox. How could we quantify that? Um, average um, response time for important emails within the team. Great. So they, I, I know it's very unfeasible to say that you could change you, your client's behaviour, but you can certainly change your own behaviours within the team and the culture within the team. Absolutely. Lovely. Um, we can go on to people using task lists that are deadline focused, if you finished with the previous one. Yeah. Um, number of people in team who use a date-based task system. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to switch that to percentage yep. of team members who use, um, what did you say, a uh, deadline-based date task system? Uh, no, uh, yeah, date-based rather than deadline-based, yeah. Based um, task system. Did I get that right? Yep, perfect. I've just said percentage because different teams can be of different sizes and just number may not give you a sense of like five in a team of five is a really bad 
manager, yeah. but five in a team of 120 is not a really bad measure. So percentage just helps us out a little bit with that. Could, could I maybe change that slightly and say percentage of team members who uh, routinely schedule their priorities? Maybe because it's less kind of um, it, it's less based on they have to use my system, which is a smart work system. Um, mm -hmm. As long as they're scheduling their work, it doesn't matter what system they're using, um, they're they're still exhibiting a good behaviour. Okay, and it's it's scheduling it, their priorities, but is it important to mention here based on start date, not just end date? Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, based on start date. Okay, or I would call it um, routinely proactively scheduling their priorities, but I, I worry that that is, um, it, it's a technical term that might need explanation. Yeah, it's a weasel word. So different people, we don't have a different understanding of proactive, because yeah. some people would say, yeah, I proactively sh schedule stuff based on yeah. the due date. Yeah, that's but fine. But you really want them to schedule based on start date, I think, yeah. I understood. Yeah. And it's worthwhile making it specific because what we're really writing here, Dermot, is um, the description of the measure. We, we're not really writing down measure names. We're writing down the thing that we're trying to quantify and the way we're trying to quantify it. So if, if a client was to pick up this and go, oh, I love that measure. That's the one I want to introduce for my team. That, they'd need to, whoops, what have I just dropped? Did you hear that bang? I heard something. Yeah, I don't only know what bang, it was. Bang. <laughs> it's all good. It wasn't a... <laughs> It wasn't glass, so it landed with a dull thud. Anyway, sorry for the distraction. That's all right. Um, yeah, they'll they'll want to be able to look at that and read the measure and understand it well enough to know what you're really trying to quanti quantify and not quantify the wrong thing. Mm. Let's go. Um, let's just do one of other and then go into um, – looking at strength and feasibility. And there's another layer to the potential measures that I want to do with you that I don't often do with, with clients, um, but it, it may it may actually serve us a bit here, but let, we'll, we'll find out. Large meetings that don't achieve outcomes with lots of people. What could you quantify? How could you quantify that? Uh, on the positive side, um... The, the number of shorter, smaller, and more focused meetings. So I'm going to do the percentage thing again here and yeah. say percentage of total meetings that are shorter, smaller, and more focused. Yeah. We want to see a rise in that? Yes. So increased percentage, maybe. Yeah. Um, oh, we don't. We don't need to put the word increase in there because no. the measure is the percentage of. I yeah, just wanted yeah. to check that what we're wanting is what we'd like in the real world is to see that percentage get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, any other way that you'd like to quantify that one about large meetings that don't achieve outcomes and have lots of people? No, I think that that's about right. Okay. So that might do us for now. Um, again, because it, it's such a, a broad topic that we could, you know, yeah. it, it really could take a couple of hours to, to fully yeah. flesh it out. Are you confident, Doma, that you're following what we're doing and you'll be able to build on it later? Totally. Totally, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can easily, yeah. you know, brainstorm uh, additional um, for all of those lists. Lovely. The thing to brainstorm would be the evidence. Yeah. These sorts of things. But then yeah. if you end up with a list that's really long and wieldy, you may want to go back and look for duplication or things that aren't yeah. really that critical and streamline after you've brainstormed. Yeah. When you do the potential measure, don't brainstorm. Ask that deliberate question I've asked you each time. Yeah. And that is, how would you focus on one of these? How would you quantify it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, one drives the other. I see that. Yeah, uh, and if if we go to brainstorming measures and forget about the list of sensory evidence, we're just going to end up with nothing that's any better than what anyone's mm. used in the past. And if no one's used anything good in the past, we end up with nothing that's good. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strength is how convincing the measure is of the results up here. I wonder if I can split my screen so that we can, because this really can help, is to make sure that we've got yeah. our result right there in front of us and we can keep referring back to it when we nice. look at these measures. So I would ask you a question. When you think of lots of first minute, last minute activity that doesn't directly serve the team's contribution to organisational strategy, is the total number of emails coming into a team member's inbox each day, how strong an indicator is that of the result? And you can use a scale of one to seven, where one is really not at all, and seven is, wow, if I just had this one measure alone, it would totally tell me about that result. One to seven. Six. Six. What did you say, Dermot? Uh, sorry, six. I reckon. Six, there we go, okay. Feasibility is how, how easily do you think your clients would be able to gather data for this? Um, and a one is it, it's absolutely impossible to do it. And seven is they've already got the data there. Somewhere in between is we kind of haven't collected the data yet, but it wouldn't be too hard to get it. So it's kind of, again, on that scale of one to seven. Probably five. Five, okay. Next one, total uninterrupted focus time in hours per team member per week. How strong an indicator is that of your result? Five. Five. How feasible would it be to get the data for that? Um, three. <laughs> and again, this may vary for your clients. Some clients may have systems where they can extract that quite easily or they have um, they are feeling so desperate about this that they're happy to have their staff give the time to logging their hours on focused yeah. activity. So therefore the feasibility may be higher for some clients than others. Yeah. Yeah. Percentage of all emails reacted to as soon as they arrive in the inbox. How strong is that one? Five. And it's feasibility? Uh, three again. Okay. Total amount of lead time for work that is delegated or requested. How strong is that? I think that's a six. And feasibility. Look, it, it would require um, people to, to keep a log or something like that for a couple of weeks. But if if that sort of activity was um, seen, you know, if, if it was backed by management, I think it's doable. Um, and I think it could be five. Okay, good. The number of instances where work is requested ASAP, how strong an indicator is that of your result up there? Again, six. Six. And, Feasibility? And I, think that's, I think that's probably easier to measure in some ways, um, uh, maybe a, a six. Okay. I'm going to scroll down a little because we've got a few more. Average response time for emails within the team, how strong is that? Uh, six. And how feasible is it? Four. Four. You're good at this. Next one. Percentage of team members who routinely schedule their priorities based on start date. How how strong an indicator is that of your result? Uh, um, seven. I was going to guess that. <laughs> it's feasibility. Um, six. And the last measure, potential measure that we did, although I imagine your list of potential measures will be longer once I give this template to you to play with, but the percentage of total meetings that are shorter, smaller and more focused. How strong an indicator is that of your result? Six. And it's feasibility? 
Five. Five. Okay. Well done. So what we do now is use the strength and feasibility ratings to figure out which measures are the best ones to select, the best balance of strength and feasibility. Strength, Dermot, is more important than feasibility because um, it's uh, you can't make a measure stronger, but you can make it more feasible by going and yeah. finding another way to get the data or whatever. Yeah. So the first one that we would select would be the one you gave a strength of seven to, because its feasibility yeah. was still pretty good. Yeah. So that's a yes. And then did you have any six sixes? Yeah, you did. So this would be another one, the number of instances yeah. where work is requested ASAP. Yeah. And then I think you had three six fives, which you could possibly go with. I'm going to say maybe. Yeah. Even though you might be thinking, oh, I absolutely need them. But mm. uh, one thing to remember is that it's very hard to bring to life a lot of measures. So totally, yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. If you have to prioritise, yeah, you'd, you'd go with measure seven and measure five. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to copy these and bring them down to the bottom of the template so that we can see them. And then I'm going to ask you another question about them. Firstly, um, when you look at those two, if, if you had a client that really wanted to reduce the, the first minute and last minute activity that's not serving the team's contribution, and you got them to measure and try and improve, firstly, the number of instances where work's requested ASAP, and secondly, improve the percentage of team members who routinely schedule their priorities based on start date. If you saw those two measures improving, would you be convinced that that result was, um, was, was reducing, that they were getting less first minute, last minute activity? Yeah, because one of them, the first one directly relates the first minute and the second one directly relates the last minute. So, um, yeah, if there was a if there was a decrease in the number of instances where work is requested ASAP and there was a, an increase in the percentage of team members for the second one, then there would be a direct correlation to the result. Yeah. Lovely. One thing we do with measurement, because there's a there's a famous thing that, that measures drive behaviour. Whatever you measure is what you get. And so if you measure yeah. the wrong thing, you get the wrong thing. So yeah. a good check here is if you measured both those things, could there be any unintended consequences that could happen? People are afraid to send things or request things that are truly urgent. Yeah, good. Could that be mitigated somehow? Could that be managed? Uh, by teaching people to be more discerning about urgency and to understand it more fully. So is that discerning good versus bad urgency? Or what do you call it, false versus real? Uh, in different circumstances, both. Um, uh, Sometimes negative, positive urgency. Uh, they're all playing on a theme. Okay, that will, that will do enough there. Okay, any other unintended consequences that you can think of? Um, oh. I think with, with team members who, who are using a, a, a scheduling system for their priorities, there's always the risk that people fall back into bad habits with their um, systems. And there's a very. Go ahead, Dermot. Yeah. I was going to say there's a very strong risk that the culture will work against what the team is trying to achieve, the wider culture and their organisation. Oh, that's a good distinction. Um, so, wider organisation and culture. Okay. Is there, just coming back to the, the middle one here, that people might fall back into bad habits, is there a way to mitigate or manage that? Um, to... have regular discussions or training 
interventions. Okay, and the oh, third oh, one. Yeah, maybe, it. maybe it's easier to say make it an ongoing topic for discussion or learning. Well, good. When I um I did some work with a, a mining, a global mining company some years ago. When I went to their offices for the first time, I had to have a safety induction, and basically every every interaction I had with anyone, the very first topic was safety. Um, yeah. You know, it was hi, how are you? As we walk down the stairs, please hold the handrail. We come into yeah. the meeting and start the meeting, and someone goes before we start the meeting. I have a safety share, and and yeah. just mention something, and it just got embedded like that. So mm. uh, it's an ongoing topic for discussion or learning. It yeah. works for them, so this could certainly yeah, work. Absolutely, it's great. Um, the wider organisational culture working against what the team's trying to achieve, can that be managed or mitigated? Uh, two things come to mind. Um, create some team agreements that yep. shift the culture. Yeah, nice. And the second thing is if it's, if it's a team um, uh, within a, a wider culture, um, uh, the, the team leaders need to influence, make it a priority to influence the wider organisation. Oh, nice. Because like with any change, you know, it's the same with, with introducing good performance measurement in an organisation. If you're introducing, um, you know, this, this new awareness of, of eradicating the wrong kind of urgency, usually the change starts in a pocket. It starts just somewhere and it's got to ripple mm. out. It doesn't always start beautifully from the boardroom and filter all the way down. That's right, yeah, totally agree. Okay, lovely. So we're now at the very final step of measure design. What I've actually put in the measure name column really belongs in the measure description column. And what we like to do is, is give each measure a really unique name that makes it memorable and easy to refer to. Uh, usually a measure name has three at the most five words in it, but it's 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 a true name. The description is a sentence that explains how the measure is quantified, but the measure name is is just a nice way of referring to it. Do you have any ideas for how you'd like to name this first one? So there's a piece that I talk about um, where I talk about the the difference between ASAP as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. a lap as late as possible which about project management terms <laughs> but in the middle is what i call uh, asar as soon as reasonable and oh, that's what i'm trying okay. to ship people to i wonder if that comes into it yeah could be something like that yeah yeah uh, the percentage of team members who routinely schedule their priorities based on start date what could you call that measure um, proactive schedule, proactive scheduling. Okay, and you don't really need the word indicator on the end of those, you could just keep them mm. as ASAR shift or proactive scheduling. Congratulations, Dermot, you've got two Lovely. measures that you've designed. And I, I know you can work, come up with better stuff than this because it's just, it's your very first time through this process. It's my first mm. time considering how somebody might measure urgency and the collaboration between the two of us has at least created a starting point here. Absolutely, oh, it's fantastic. Great, a lot of clarity there, and a lot of of stuff to work on. Um, yeah, really great process. And it, for me, I'm it kind send of. These to you. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, for me, it, re it kind of it changes the way I might be able to talk to um, my clients about urgency and about what they need to be thinking about. Yep. Um, yeah, very useful. Lovely. Super. So, yeah, you'll have the templates and you'll you'll be able to keep working on that um, and, and rethinking it if you want to and, and just using it however however serves you. Um, any, any final reflections, Dermot, on, um, on measuring urgency? Yeah, look, I have to say that it, it, um, it, it seems like a very nebulous topic and it's prevalent in every workplace. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people have really thought in detail about what it really is. But for me, this has given a lot of, of very concrete um, uh, detail to how 
it, it could be measured and I think the end result is it's obviously very measurable. That's it. I'm glad, I'm glad we got to that point. That's brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing that experience with us, Dermot. I know it could have just been you and me privately going through it and I just, I just want to express my gratitude for you. Um, being prepared to put this out there so that other people, um, at least in my community, who are interested in, in measuring these nebulous things, get, gets, you know, gets the chance to see how it can work. And uh, yeah, I'm, it, it may be something that, um, that you could, that some of your clients might find useful too. And if that's the case, they're more than welcome to, to join in. But thank you so much for, for being open to doing that. Uh, look, and thank you. It's such an opportunity for me and it's going to add so much value to, to the book and, and to the methodology. So um, you, as always, have my, my undying gratitude. <laughs> You're gorgeous. Everybody, I, I recommend Dermot's work. Um, like I've known him for a few years and yes, he is a friend, but he's a friend because I've come to really respect and admire um, and love what he does and how he does it. Um, Dermot, you're just, you're the, the most kind and gentle and generous and clever and thoughtful person. And you you take concepts that people struggle with and you you make them so simple and practical. And, and they're some of the reasons why I just adore what you do. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure um, doing thank this you. with you. Thank you.